Hey. What's up? I'm here today for yet another video on stoicism. I'm sorry that this subject keeps coming up, but I feel disingenuous talking about things I don't know about, and Stoic philosophy is one of the only things that I do know about, so I would expect some more. I'll, I, I promise I'll try not to flood your feed with Stoic literature. Though I would expect it every now and every then. I've been talking about Stoicism a lot on my channel, but I've come to realize that I never explained what it is, at least in enough detail to have any really understanding of what I'm talking about. I'll start in the way in which most people start by explaining Stoicism. Stoicism is an ancient Greek and then Roman philosophy. There you go. That's it. Um, it, it's an ancient ethics-based practical lifestyle philosophy. It's a philosophy from a time where philosophy's purpose was to give you kind of a guiding principle to live your life by. Some contemporary philosophy does do this, and others does not. And I'm not going to comment on whether or not that is a good thing, but it's the way it is. Now, primarily, Stoicism is a philosophy based on logical proposal and assumptions about human nature and um, some things like that. One of the most fundamental ideas of Stoic philosophy is the Stoic dichotomy of control, which basically is an idea that we only have the complete influence or control over a few things. We don't have influence or control over our public image, or even our, our health. We only have control to a small part. How long we live, when we die, who we meet, how people treat us. All things which are outside of your person are not really under your control. But then, what is under your control? Well, the only thing that is mainly under your control are your own thoughts, perceptions, and actions. Therefore, you can't determine what will happen in a situation, but you can determine that what you will do in the situation will be right. It doesn't matter what happens, but it does matter what you do. Therefore, the Stoics only have an internal idea of good and bad. Good being cultivating a good and true character, and bad being something which stops you doing that. A vice, an addiction to something evil or bad, but something like death 
something like illness or disease is not necessarily viewed as a negative thing in Stoicism because the only thing which the Stoics give value to is your character. It's how good your character is. And thus, that is where the popular use of the word Stoic comes from. Stoicism with a capital S. I don't know if this is going to be reversed or not. Stoicism with a capital S is a philosophy. Stoicism with a lowercase s is a describing word to describe someone who appears unaffected by many a thing. Someone who is stoic in the face of danger is someone who is Liam Neeson. Now, the Stoics got this not because they were suppressing their emotions, which is a bad thing to do. I don't think anyone thinks suppressing your emotions is good. That's a common misconception about Stoicism. The Stoics just genuinely didn't care about things that didn't matter. What mattered to a Stoic is how you conducted yourself. If you had got to the end of a day, and everything that you did was right, that's a perfect day. And thus, it doesn't matter if someone assaults you, or if you lose your house, or your wealth, because that didn't alter anything. It only altered your circumstance. But it didn't change that part of you to the Stoics, which was given to you by the gods. Going further into detail about why the Stoics only valued character, there is also a theory behind human nature, which is not necessarily just from their logical proposals concerning what is and isn't under your control. They also viewed the human animal as a mainly rational being. The reason they said this was so was because they viewed the only difference fundamentally between animals and humans as being the ability to think and rationalize apart from our more base instincts of anger, greed, and things like this. We are, as far as the Stoics are concerned, the only intellectual creatures who can use philosophy to be better than what our instincts tell us. Therefore, similar to the Buddhists, the Stoics think that good or bad does not actually exist outside of yourself. They are just your own perceptions, and you have the ability to override these, as this is your special, unique nature which is not given to animals, and thus to be truly a human, to exercise your humanity, to be most uniquely a part of our species is to utilize this intellect. It's to think. It's to use philosophy. It's to care about what is moral, not to care about what you instinctually feel. That is, in its core, what the Stoics believed to be the most human thing possible. Now, I have just repeated myself in a few different ways, coming to the same conclusion in a few different ways. Not only is this because my brain works in circles when I think, but it's also because it's the way the Stoics do it. When you read Stoic literature, they really hammer into your brain a few of the core principles 
and they keep giving you different logical reasons why you should believe them and they keep giving you examples and they keep pumping it and it's really quite hard to read a full stoic text and not agree with them by the end the only times where I've seen someone have a logical disagreement are usually when they have either misinterpreted or purposely misinterpreted a Stoic text. The fundamentals of Stoicism are genuinely accepted by most psychologists and philosophers in modern contemporary philosophy. The idea that we can slightly alter or even control our perceptions and values is something which is definitely imbued in our modern understanding of how the brain and the human vessel works in society. Now I shall take you a guide through some notable ancient Stoic authors. I'll try to do this in chronological order, but not necessarily order of importance. Now, initially, Stoicism started, or at least the Stoic school, started with someone called Zeno, or Zeno, however you wish to pronounce, Zeno Citium. And basically, this was a man who was transporting valuable dyes, and had a shipwreck. He then went to a bookshop. He then found a cynic philosopher, decided to become a student, and then founded his own branch of cynic philosophy called Stoicism. Now, based on his writings, there were many teachers who recorded various different things, but the next notable Stoic is someone called Epictetus, who wrote the Discourses of Epictetus and the Enchiridion, which is actually a handbook of the summation of what Epictetus thought. Now keep in mind, both of these were actually written via one of his students recording his lectures. And just to go back to Zeno of Citium, there aren't any extant, real, tangible sources of his writing. There's only kind of slight mentions of his logical proposal in other works. Epictetus is known as the slave philosopher. Um, and this is largely because he was a slave who damaged his leg quite badly, who studied philosophy, and then got let free and became a lecturer. And if you read his style of Stoic philosophy in his books, it's quite intense. And the way in which he talks to himself is quite sometimes quite aggressive he kind of talks to himself as if he were a slave master commanding a slave he calls himself a slave and that is what Epictetus means I'm not sure if we really know the real name of the author the next person on the list chronologically, is Lucius Seneca. Um, he was a Roman statesman who tutored a emperor, one who later went crazy, um, Nero. If you know about Nero, you'll know that he's quite insane. Um, Seneca's also interesting apart from his writings, is also interesting historically because his brother is mentioned in the Bible. Now, Seneca wrote a bunch of letters to his friend Lucilius. They are 
moral letters where he's guiding him. He's counselling him on how to live a good and philosophical life. And it does seem like they are good friends. Now, we don't exactly know who this Lucilius person is. Some people theorise that his letters to Lucilius may actually be kind of this larger work which he created for his students, and this Lucilius person may have been a example character. But we don't know either way. Lucilius could definitely be a real person. And finally, and most likely the most famous, is Marcus Aurelius. He is, many consider, the last good emperor of Rome. If you've seen Gladiator, he is the old man with wispy white hair. Marcus Aurelius wrote a personal journal called The Meditations, and it was taken and replicated into one of the most influential books of all time. And to juxtapose heavily to Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius is known as the Emperor Philosopher, or the Philosopher King. And people, when reading, are very interested to see how he manages to stay pure of heart, with good and solid intentions, even when exposed to the most power any human had on the planet at the time. It seems that, maybe only in this case, the absolute power did not corrupt absolutely. And so there you go, there are the main people. There are others, and I can go further, but I think I'll have to cap it at the main people. Now, let's get into the exciting bit of the video. I have told you that Stoicism is a practical philosophy, so that means there's stuff to do. You may have homework. The first thing that Stoic philosophers in general say for you to do is to do something like journaling, is to take a dedicated time of day and think about what you did right and what you did wrong with the purpose of improving and reviewing yourself. There is a reason why most philosophies and world religions have a dedicated time of day for self-reflection through prayer, through meditation. And Stoicism is the same. It's important and useful to revitalize your goals and your beliefs every single day. Epictetus said, Allow not sleep to close your wearied eyes until you have reckoned up each daytime deed. Where did I go wrong? What did I do? What duties do I have left undone? From first to last, review your acts and reprove yourself for cowardly or wretched acts. But rejoice in those well done. The second on our BuzzFeed Stoicism list is to avoid labelling external things outside of yourself as either good or bad. This can be quite difficult, but if you value your character, your person, as the most important thing, not how you look, not what, not how you look, not what country you come from, not your riches, but your personality and how you treat people, 
then you should realise that things that aren't related to those aspects of yourself are neither good nor bad. If there is something about your body that upsets you, it really doesn't matter, because it doesn't change who you are as a person. And the Stoics don't mean that in a counselling way, sort of, oh, don't think about it way. They genuinely believe that that really doesn't matter at all, and it's almost humorous to care. If the only thing that you really care about is if you're doing the right thing at every moment, other people's opinions have little to no value. And as an extension of this idea, Marcus Aurelius also says that the obstacle is the way. Now, basically, external events which you may categorize as either good or bad end up being the pathway of your life. As far as we know, we only get to do this stuff once. And so, your life has ups and downs, but it doesn't split. There is no point where your life splits, where it may have gone another way and it didn't. Things go as they do, and they only happen one way. So all obstacles that happen to you are a part of your journey, and are the journey which you're taking. They can't not be. And even more than this, all things which happen which may be traditionally counted or considered as a negative happen to be opportunities to work on the aspect of yourself which you care most about. Negative situations allow you to test and improve aspects of your personality unlike any other. That's why, in many situations, you have examples of the ancient Stoics being happy even more so than normal when they were suffering. It's not masochistic. It's not out of some love to suffer. But it's the opportunity to improve yourself for challenge. Marcus Aurelius, I don't remember where the quote comes from, but he says that when he suffers a misfortune, like an illness or disease, that he considers himself lucky, or the world lucky, and that this is the way he wanted things to go, as someone with a more maladaptive philosophy, someone who couldn't take it, didn't get it, and he did. He'd rather himself have the problem than someone else. Because he knows that he can not only deal with it better, but come out the other side stronger. Thus, the obstacles in your way are the way through. Okay. The next is called the view from above. Stoics not only viewed the universe through value and character, but also had their own views on cosmology and science. They viewed the universe as extremely large, as I think most people do. And thus, they viewed the problems of individuals as very small, as our lifetimes, our physical selves, in comparison to the total space 
of the entire universe in time, both forwards and back, is extraordinarily small. And when you were thinking about your own problems, the Stoics advised you to physically imagine yourself rising above your body, above your house, above your neighbourhood. How small do your problems seem when compared to all of the grievances and experiences of all of the people in your whole city? How about as compared to the whole of your country? All grievances, all experiences of the entirety of the planet, of the entirety of the universe. How small is our planet compared to the rest? How small is your life in comparison to all lives which have come before you? How small and unmemorable is it to those which come after? Why in the world would you consider concerning yourself with other people's opinions when they're not going to remember you? Are you frightened of the time before your birth? Why be frightened of the time after? The Stoics are extremely radical. To a line of being offensive to some. In fact, a whole school of philosophy was born out of Stoicism being offensive. It's called skepticism. If you're a skeptic, you have an apprehension to believe in something. And the whole history of the skeptic school of philosophy was basically to act and refine the Stoic school. Most of the writings and work of the skeptics was to do with refining and reviewing and rebuking the Stoics, and in turn, I think this did improve the Stoic school of philosophy. Your problems are small. You're small. So don't worry. Just do what you can. Do your best. Try to do the right thing. Other stuff doesn't matter at all. The next, in a similarly gloomy way, is called Memento Mori. Memento Mori is remembering that you're going to die. You're going to stop living. And what does that mean? What does that connote? What does that connotate? Well, it means, first of all, that there's stakes. There's actually stuff at stake. You have reason to be motivated because your time is ticking. And be aware, the Stoics say that when you consider your time, you should think at every moment, is this something that I'm going to miss if I die? Is what I'm doing right now really worth it? Should I be doing something else? And remembering that you're going to die is quite important. You'd be surprised how many philosophies across the entire world has some sort of memento mori. There is a popular saying that you should live every day like it's your last. There is a famous art style of both architecture and classic art called Memento Mori after this philosophy. The Christians adapted Memento Mori and its essential theme in both the New and Old Testament and the early church and early and late Christian theologians. Islam, both in the Quran and with a hadith, specifically with a prayer for remembering death, both value the remembrance of death as an important aspect of life 
in Buddhism, of course, is very concerned with death. Buddha was deeply afraid and disturbed by death, probably more than anyone has ever been before, as he was never exposed to any suffering or anything like that until his adolescence, and thus he ran away. He left his child and wife to solve this problem. That's how important it was, and he created a form of philosophy called Buddhism. I actually don't know how it got its name. I don't know if he called what he thought, like me, like if I made a philosophy and called it Harryism. Don't know. I assume that's not the way it went. Now, you may have noticed that the sun is getting more bright. It's the afternoon and it's shining through the window. And I'd like to wrap up this video by giving you a reading list, maybe some homework if you're interested. The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius is the most famous Stoic text. Then there's also the Letters to Lucilius, the Enchiridion, and the Ep Discourses of Epictetus. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about Stoic philosophy, I would recommend those. And I have book reviews on Stoicism and more to come. And so thank you for joining me for another episode. I hope that you learned something. Maybe you were challenged. Maybe you thought in a new way that you hadn't thought before, but I hope that even with intellectual processes happening in your brain, you managed to relax, to find reprieve, to avoid worry about stuff that doesn't matter, and good night.